Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the next version of our park spe speaker series. We have a great uh, session for you today uh, with guests from the uh, city of San Diego to talk about their master plan. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Riley. I'm the director of the parks department. And again, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I'm going to go into just some housekeeping before I introduce our guests today. Uh, first, we're recording this session. Uh, uh, we'll be providing a link following the presentation so you can refer back to any information uh, that you would like to after the live event. Um, second, I want to direct your attention to the upper right screen where you see a question mark. This is the Q&A box. This is where you can submit your questions or comments at any time throughout the presentation. We'll set aside time at the end of the presentation for Q&A and I will serve as moderator. And then next, for those of you who are pursuing continuing, continuing education credits through the American Planning Association's Professional Institute or the Landscape Architecture Continuing Education System, please click on the sign in link in the Q&A box uh, so we have a record of your attendance today. Just want to give a quick uh, introduction to our agency before I introduce our guests in case you're, you're new to the park speaker series. We're a very unique, uh, large regional uh, parks and planning agency that serves a little over 2 million residents in Montgomery and Prince George's County. So we're a state chartered by county agency. I'm the director in the Montgomery side where we have 424 parks and a little over 37,000 acres of parkland that comprises about 10% uh, of the county. So our park speaker series and our themes tend to deal with uh, park and planning issues of uh, common interest around the country and today's is no different as our county is growing and urbanizing and becoming more diverse. I think this is something you'll hear from our guests today that they're dealing with too in their location. So let's get to today's topic, uh, park master planning. Like many cities throughout the country, San Diego has experienced a population surge over the last few decades and is increasingly becoming more diverse and urban. 40% of the city's 1.4 million residents speak a language other than English at home, and 26% of the population is foreign born, more than double the US average. San Diego's uh, planning team was recently tasked with developing a new master plan to meet the city's changing recreational needs. Their goal was to address access to and enjoyment of parks for all genders, ages, and abilities. In creating this master plan, their team employed many innovative strategies, including reimagining park standards and developing a new citywide park development impact fee. So today, uh, joining us to uh, share their insight into this master planning process are Heidi Van Blom and Jonathan Avila. Heidi oversees the environmental policy and public spaces planning section of the city of San Diego's planning department. She has over 15 years experience as a land use planner and attorney and previously served as a land use attorney in the city attorney's office where she advised on and litigated a variety of land use and environmental matters. Jonathan Avila is a registered landscape architect with 10 years experience as a designer, construction manager, and planner. He's a park designer in the city of San Diego's planning department and works to ensure the equitable distribution of park space throughout the city. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Heidi to begin the presentation. Thank you, Mike, and um, thank you to your whole team for hosting us at your speaker series. Um, as Mike mentioned, my name is Heidi Von Blum. I oversee a um, division within our planning department at the city of San Diego called Environmental Policy and Public Spaces. Um, one of the um, components of the work that we do is parks planning um, and we do partner with a separate department called our parks and recreation department um, in all of the park planning um, work that we do. Um, I'm also joined here today with Jonathan, Jonathan Avila who is the project manager for the parks master plan effort. He is also a registered landscape architect and a park designer in our planning department. 
Um, so we are very excited today to present to you um, what we've called our Complete Communities Play Everywhere program. This is our Parks Master Plan package um, that we hope will provide play everywhere for everyone in San Diego. Uh, we are presenting a new innovative plan that begins to address inequities that we know we have in our park system um, and ensures equitable access to parks for everyone. This parks plan represents a sea change in how we plan for parks, and for that, we are really excited to share that with you. We are excited for the opportunity to begin to address inequities throughout the park system and to plan for new and exciting parks that meet the needs of a changing demographic and development trends in our city. Next slide, please. To give you a little bit of background about our city's structure, um, we have a population of over 1.2 million residents. Um, actually, it says 1.4 million, so I'm a little behind here. Um, we have a strong mayor form of governance with a nine member city council. So all of us report to our mayor um, under that strong mayor form of governance, um, and then we present our items to our city council. We have over 11,000 employees in our jurisdiction, um, and we work, as I mentioned, collaboratively with our Parks and Recreation Department, which is our implementation department and oversees all of the ongoing maintenance and operations of the parks that we plan for. The Parks Master Plan um, effort that we're presenting to today, today um, is the culmination of a multi-year planning and public outreach um, effort that was led um, by both of our departments, the Planning Department and the Park and Recreation Department. Next slide, please. Our city's park system consists of over 42,000 acres of assets, including over 400 parks, underwater reserves, 200 miles of trails, and conserved open spaces. When combined, these assets make San Diego the second largest urban park system in the country. The system also offers a wide variety of programs and events at recreation centers, aquatic centers, teen centers, ranger centers, um, and visitor centers as well. Next slide, please. Um, to give you some context of why we are presenting a parks master plan, um, and let me give you a little bit of background. Um, this plan has not yet been adopted, but we are planning to um, bring this forward for our city council's approval in two weeks from today. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, um, it's helpful to understand the framework that we have in our city for planning parks. Um, when the city first adopted its general plan update in 2008, that general plan included a recreation element that set forth a broad citywide vision for parks. But it also recognized the need for a more refined citywide parks policy, specifically to address parks needs to reflect the city's new development trends. The parks master plan is the culmination of a many years long effort to develop this citywide parks policy. While the parks master plan sets forward a master vision for a successful citywide park system, further implementation is something that we know is key to the success of the city achieving its vision. We will be continuing to update our community plans, which are the land use components of our general plan, to be able to identify specific park opportunities. And through a public process, as we develop general development plans, which are specific park concept plans, followed by construction plans, we will be able to begin to deliver more parks to more people much faster than the way that we currently plan for parks. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan um, to give a little bit of background on San Diego's development and park history. Thank you, Heidi. Um, San Diego's development and park history starts with the Kumeyaay sovereignty. San Diego's development as a city has long been rooted in its natural landscape and open spaces. The Kumeyaay people were the first inhabitants of San Diego with ties to the region spanning 12,000 years. The Kumeyaay subsisted in hunting and gathering, relying on San Diego's diverse ecology throughout the year. These places, the places they hunted and gathered are the parks and open spaces we know today. The Mission in Old Town, San Spanish settlement at the Mission de Alacala and Old Town formed around Spanish style public spaces. Horan's new town and inner suburbs. This period sees the first subdivision of residential tracks and tracks around downtown followed by a building boom. The creation of the city's park, of, also the creation of City Park, now known as Balboa Park, and the beginning of the Navy presence in San Diego. Post-war boom and planned development. Post-war, post-World War II, the city expanded past the first ring of suburbs 
Mission Bay was dredged and created. The first parks master plan was approved in 1956, and the development, fee, development fees aimed at improving infrastructure, including parks, were adopted. Smart growth. During this period, the city recognizes the importance of conservation with the creation of the Multiple Species Conservation Program, an era, an era of infill park development in communities begins, infill development of first ring suburbs along, the housing, along with housing growth in downtown. Chicano Park is designated a National Historic Landmark, and the current park master plan effort is undertaken. Back to you, Heidi. Thank you, Jonathan. Next slide, please. So why do we need this park master plan? In addition to the general plan identifying the need for the new parks master plan, we also knew that we needed a new vision to address inequities in our park system. And we also know that we needed it to allow ourselves to plan for new parks and recreational opportunities in areas experiencing the most growth that under our existing system may present significant challenges to providing innovative and flexible approaches to meeting parks needs. And we need it to advance the city's climate goals. The city adopted a landmark climate action plan in 2015, which identified strategic land use planning specifically by locating new development close to transit as one of the most significant ways that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and support cleaner air for everyone. A new strategy to provide parks for such development is critical, not just for park planning, but for the city's climate goals as well. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the Parks Master Plan is the culmination of a nearly three-year planning effort. Throughout this time period, the Planning Department, in coordination with the Parks and Recreation Department, engaged in various outreach activities, including a citywide statistically valid survey, 13 in-person workshops, online activities, and informational presentations to various advisory bodies. During the public review period earlier this spring, we were fortunate to receive feedback on the plan from over 500 individuals and organizations. We also presented to various um, uh, advisory bodies, including our Parks and Recreation Board, um, a committee um, for our, our regional, our greatest regional park, Balboa Park, um, as well as another regional park, the Mission Bay Park Committee. We've also presented to the Planning Commission as well as our city's mobility board. Next slide, please. Through our outreach efforts, we learned that people not only wanted to see parks within their neighborhood, but also valued open spaces and trails, beaches and shorelines, and various programming within the city's facilities. We also saw that residents largely favored upgrades to existing parks, while also identifying the importance to acquire new land for parks. We heard that there were opportunities to add recreational value within existing public spaces, and that residents wanted to see this type of investment occurring. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan to go over some of our demographics and recreation trends in our city. Thank you, Heidi. Busy lifestyles create a demand for activities that can be done spontaneously, focused on health and socialization, and independently. Additionally, we found a need for organized sports, generational play, and emerging programs. By 2050, our city will be bigger, a population of about 1.8 million people, much old or older will be 24%, 24% of our residents will be 60 years or older. We will, we will be more urban. The downtown, eastern, and southern communities will see most of the city's population growth, and most of the growth will be multifamily homes in transit-focused areas, and will be more diverse, a growing multicultural community. Next slide, please. The Parks Master Plan is made up of five guiding principles. The first is relevant. Parks and recreational programs should meet the, meet the changing needs and wants of residents. Accessible, every resident, every resident should be able to get to a park space or recreation program safely, conveniently, and actively. Parks should be iconic. Parks should reflect the unique qualities of their settings and enhance the image of the city and its diverse communities. Sustainable. Park improvements, programs, and management strategies should contribute to the community to the community's economic development and well-being in a healthy environment and equitable. Park planning and invest investments should address historical inequities in the city's park system experienced by people that live in communities of concern by ensuring that people that everyone has equal access to meaningful and recre meaningful recreational opportunities. 
Next slide. Back over to Heidi. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so overall, the parks master plan vision um, that we are putting forward uh, provides for a plan for equitable investments where we know that the investments are needed the most. We want to ensure easy and safe walking, biking, and transit access to parks for everyone. We want to provide opportunities for everyone to play outside and connect socially. We also want the ability to comprehensively plan for an interconnected citywide park system, acknowledging that great parks are needed in individual communities, but that individual parks are part of a larger citywide system that everyone should have access to. And we also want to see thriving recreational spaces that would allow for new recreational experiences. Next slide, please. The Parks Master Plan identifies some key recommendations. First, it includes new equity goals. We've also included a reformed and equitable citywide park development impact fee. We've included a new general plan park standard, as well as a new 10, 20, 30, 40 minute access goal. Next slide, please. The Parks Master Plan is a plan grounded in equity. Park planning and investments should address systemic and historical inequities experienced by people in communities of concern. The investments should promote equal access to enjoy the many physical and social benefits of public parks. It should prioritize investments that enhance and expand recreation and communities of concern, as well as promote gender equity, design, um, designed parks for people of all abilities and ages, and also should ensure safe and enjoyable access to parks for all modes of travel. Next slide, please. To see where we want to head, we must first understand the problem with the current system. Under the city's existing system, only 5% of all development impact fees have been spent on parks and communities of concern. We looked at our city's climate equity index, which identifies areas with very low and low access to opportunity based on 35 factors developed with stakeholder input, which are the city's communities of concern and the areas that deserve the most investments. A new standard and a new system are needed to begin to address these inequities. Under the city's current park standards, inequities and investments in parks in the city will continue. We believe that investing where the needs are greatest is not only a good thing, but is critical to addressing existing inequities and planning for a thriving, successful citywide park system. Next slide, please. We need to prioritize investments where the greatest needs exist, and we need to invest in a citywide system for all. This includes ensuring that all people in the city, regardless of where they live, have safe and easy access to parks nearby, as well as access to enjoy the great, diverse, and unique park system that our city has to offer. For example, we want everyone to enjoy our regional parks and beaches, even if those resources are not located where a particular individual may reside. Next slide, please. The city's current development impact fees are charged to cover the cost of new parks needed to serve new development on residential units throughout the city but depending on the community that the development occurs within, that fee varies greatly, as low as $600 in some communities to as high as $30,000 in other communities. We are currently planning for 50 different park systems in 50 different communities, rather than one system to be enjoyed by everybody. This current structure also greatly limits our ability to deliver parks anywhere in the city. Under state law requirements, we are required to spend fees received only for the purpose for which they are collected. We currently collect fees to only be used in the communities in which they are collected. If each community wanted a $1 million park and we collect $999,000 in 50 different communities, under that system, which is the system that we currently have today, nobody is able to get a park because each community is lacking $100,000 to complete that park. When we transition to a new citywide fee moving forward, that $999,000 from each community is pooled into one $50 million fund, where the city can immediately provide more parks to more people throughout our city. This shift also allows the city to plan for parks as part of a citywide park system and provide a more simplified fee across the city. Next slide, please. The parks master plan also contains a 10, 20, 30, 40 minute access goal. This goal seeks to achieve a 10 minute walk to a safe and enjoyable nearby park for everyone. 
In addition, it includes 20 and 30 minute bike and transit access goals to increase mobility options for everyone to access a more diverse range of recreational experiences throughout the city. These time goals are measured by access to a park that can be enjoyed for at least 40 minutes, meaning that the park should be safe, activated and fun to be enjoyed for a good amount of time. Next slide, please. The general plan currently identifies a park standard based solely on park acreage, 2.8 acres for every 1,000 residents. This standard is measured at the community planning level, not at the citywide level, meaning that some communities that lack space lack the ability to meet the standard, um, thereby lose on opportunities for new recreational spaces. Additionally, this standard has contributed to the inequities that we see in investments in our park system in our communities of concern. Because the funds are constrained for specific communities, communities of concern not only lack investments in their communities, but lack meaningful access to the parks being built outside of their communities. Next slide, please. A practical and meaningful standard reflects the variety of recreational experiences within a large diverse city, such as the city of San Diego, and promotes positive recreational outcomes, such as safe, accessible, and active parks. The plan identifies a new standard to allow for the city to deliver more recreational opportunities sooner for everyone. The standard is based on recreational value. Size factors into recreational value, but value is recognized for many other factors as well. The plan establishes a standard of 14 points of recreational value per 1,000 residents. The points relate to carrying capacity, recreational opportunities, access, and activation. Recreational value emphasizes the activities and experiences that residents can enjoy rather than simply the parkland area in a given area. Next slide, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan to explain how we um, in our city developed this new park standard. Thank you, Heidi. How did we develop the park standard? First, we looked at defining a park. So we defined a park as the land that the park sits on, its inherent recreational experiences or value that are with, held within the park, and then equity and access. We then looked at our current standard and evaluated it. That's the 2.8 acre standard per thousand. We then solicited community input, took inventory of our recreational assets, surveyed our citizens, and performed research. Based on the input we received and the research we performed, we developed a park scoring matrix with the help of our consultant team. We then set the standard based on four communities that met the previous acreage, acreage standard of 2.8 acres per thousand population in 2020. These communities recreational amenities were scored, yielding an average recreational value of 14 points per thousand people. This is now proposed to be applied citywide. A recreational value of 14 points per thousand people represents a range of recreational experiences comparable to the opportunities available to residents and communities that previously achieved the acreage based standard. Next slide. The next series of slides will go over a few case studies. First is Children's Park case study. Children's Park is a 1.7 acre downtown space with a pine forest and small pond. A limited range of available amenities and a design geared towards passive recreation has made activating this site challenging. Under the value standard, current amenities in this in Children's Park offer 11 points of recreational value. This value includes points for public art, proximity to a cycle track, proximity to public transit, and a connection to a public or civic use. Next slide. A planned revitalization will activate the park with new activities to attract regular use by families, nearby workers and downtown residents. The proposed design would add public artwork, a children's play area, a picnic area, open space turf, an elevated walkway, a vendor and restroom building, an off-leash dog area, and adult fitness area. The planned amenities will significantly increase the site's point total to 33. Children's Park was designed prior to the completion of the park's master plan and is a clear example that park design within the city has was trending towards fully activating park sites to ensure the greatest number of people could enjoy the site. Next slide, please. On this slide, you'll see renderings of children par Children's Park before and after. 
you can see the elevated walk and also the restroom building and the open lawn area. Next slide. Next, we'll discuss Piazza della Familia. This land, the land that the piazza is located on was once a portion of Date Street used by local residents and customers for parking. The street and joining spaces pr provided no recreational value to the surrounding neighborhoods. What, what you can't see in this slide also is that this is located in a really um, a great neighborhood. So there's a lot of restaurants and cafes along this, this street um, and it makes it great for a public space. Next slide. As part of the redevelopment of Little Italy, a one block stretch of the existing street network was closed off to vehicular traffic, establishing a pedestrian only area. This reclaimed land became what is now known as Piazza della Familia, a 0.38 acre pocket park. This central gathering place now hosts farmers markets, concerts, cultural events, and casual social activities throughout the day and evening. Under the value standard, the food and concession area, public art and event space on the, on the site offer 11 points of recreational value. The Piazza de Familia demonstrates opportunities to bring appealing energy-filled spaces to the city's quick-growing, more compact urban neighborhoods. The Piazza also illustrates a key policy direction within the park's master plan. The creative repurposing of existing street use, street right-of-ways, for new recreational spaces that meets everyone's needs. Next slide. On this slide, you'll see a before and after of the Piazza de Familia. You can see how it was once just a street for parking and now it's being activated by daily users having lunch. Next slide. The park's master plan additionally includes a variety of policies and goals to ensure successful implementation of a great parks, great city park system. The policies are park and programming, opportunities for everyone to play, explore, learn, and interact. Equity and access, access within, access within a 10 minute walk and roll, 20 minute bike ride, a 30 minute transit ride for everyone to park or recreational experience that can be enjoyed for at least 40 minutes. Activation, safe and inviting public spaces that support positive experiences for everyone and that further equity and access goals. Co-benefit, multi-purpose park spaces that improve overall quality of life. Community building, parks that are the focal points of our communities. Arts and culture, parks that express the unique identity of our communities and connect people to the arts and cultural experiences. Next slide. As well as mobility as recreation, a citywide network of safe, active recreational links that connect people with parks and public spaces. Conservation, sustainability, and resilience. A park system that preserves and enhances our natural landscape while making the city more active and resilient. Partnerships, a, co a collaborative network of partners and resources that improves and expands recreational opportunities throughout the city. Operation and maintenance, an efficient, durable, and well-maintained park system that provides consistent long-term quality to everyone. Recreational parks, well-maintained and accessible regional parks that showcase unique scenic, natural, historic, or cultural resources while offering everyday recreation. And finally, funding, sustainable, equitable, and dedicated funding sources to, the, to invest in the city's park system. Thank you, that brings us to the end of our presentation and we're ready for questions and answers when you are. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi and Jonathan. That was extremely impressive and you're doing some really creative work. Uh, it really astounds me the commonality of the uh, issues you're dealing with and the goals that you have. Uh, I feel like we could, uh, uh, once your plan gets adopted, I feel like we could take it and change the name to uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission and save ourselves a lot of money and a, a few years of work um, by change. We'd have, of course, changed some maps and communities and neighborhoods too, but uh, it really, it really jumped out at me that we are uh, dealing with uh, so many similar things. Uh, one that is so impressive, I think, is the equitable access focus 
of your plan uh, and trying to assure that all communities um, have equitable access. So one of the first questions I saw was uh, something about outreach that we're, I think, all dealing with in our industry. We want to hear from people we haven't traditionally heard from and we want to serve uh, people uh, in communities that perhaps we haven't served as we've served as well as we wanted to. So did uh, did you have any particular insights in your uh, community outreach and input phase uh, that you thought was uh, produced uh, any, um, you know, surprised you with the value it produced uh, that we might want to emulate? How did you how did you best make sure you heard from communities that maybe you haven't heard from enough in the past? Yeah, that's a great question and and um, remember that this is um, the end of a three year effort um, and um, just uh, to give a little bit of background on, on a kind of a typical government story of getting a plan to completion is that um, neither Jonathan and I were um, here in the department at the beginning of this effort, um, which is when most of the public outreach was occurring. Um, from what from what we you know gathered when we came in, um, there was a lot of traditional public outreach that had been done in the form of having in-person community workshops. Um, but when we looked at the um, participation at those community workshops, we kind of saw that it was um, people that we always expected um, to participate, but nobody that we didn't expect to participate. And so we wanted to do a little bit more follow up on that. Um, the citywide statistically valid survey was con conducted by a consultant and did give us um, information because they were able to um, proactively reach out to, I believe, about 1300 residents. Um, but we also then um, pushed out a series of online surveys. Um, we created a scrolling website um, in partnership with our web team that kind of really broke down um, what this parks plan was about um, so that a normal person um, could understand um, what the real implications were um, for its implementation and then created a series of questions um, to get survey responses on that, which we did take a lot of the responses to that um, as um, as a way that we used to make a lot of refinements to the plan that we had originally released for public review. Um, other things that we did um, for the in-person prior to um, the COVID pandemic um, was that we tried to um, create events um, that had more than just um, sort of like a traditional workshop. Um, our Parks and Recreation Department sent out rangers with their snakes to show off. Um, they, we had dance lessons um, to try and get more youth engaged. Um, but even with that, it's very hard for us as a jurisdiction to create our own event. So we also focused on going to events that were created by our community partners. Um, so for example, we have um, an event called Ciclos Dias um, where we shut down our streets and it becomes kind of a big biking street festival. Um, um, and so we put up a booth there so that we could talk to people going there. We went to our clean air day. Um, we've done other pop up events um, at, at things like our Earth Fair. Um, and then um, Jonathan um, and the other park designers on our team really did a, a concentrated effort to proactively reach out to um, more underrepresented uh, underrepresented community groups, um, made specific contact with them, and then we set up individual briefings um, with those community organizations and then really asked them for their partnership to reach out to their um, contacts um, within them. Um, during the pandemic, um, it actually became a lot easier for us to do outreach because it's a lot easier for us to kind of like pop up at a whole bunch of different evening um, community forums. So pretty much anybody that invited us um, act after we had done some outreach, anybody that invited us to one of their groups, we just popped up on Zoom, gave a presentation, answered questions, and we got a lot of interesting feedback that we never would have gotten um, if it hadn't been for the pandemic. We made a lot of changes um, based on kind of that a lot of the, the feedback that we got during the pandemic um, resulted in some of the greatest changes that we were able to make to our plan. And I think it's because we reached out, um, we were able to reach populations that we traditionally did not reach out to before. Thank you so much uh, for that answer. Uh, next question that popped up. Uh, I'm really interested in learning more about your 10, 20, 30, 40 concept. Does this level of service concept work well in all areas of the city, including communities of concern? 
Yeah, so the 10 minute walk standard came from the Trust for Public um, Lands um, recommendation for a 10 minute walk to a local park. Um, but in addition to that, we didn't want to limit our residents just to the parks that they have in their community. We really want to focus um, on our mobility connections. Um, this is also really important. Everything that we do, we really try and align it with our city's climate goals. Our climate action plan is really a core um, guiding policy plan um, that we, we want to make sure that we're further implementing as we move forward with any other of our land use plans. Um, so with respect to the access, you know, with under our climate action plan, we have a, a, a very um, concentrated focus on increasing um, walking, biking and transit opportunities. And we know that in our city, which is just covers an enormous geographic area with a very diverse population um, that's currently constrained with its access, um, we really wanted to focus on how do we increase the amount of recreational opportunity that people have access to. Uh, we have amazing regional parks and beaches and shorelines and open space areas, um, and we want everybody to have access to that. So we really focused on how do we make sure that everybody has access to this diverse array of recreational resources without a car, um, which is which is the reality for most residents living in the communities of concern. Um, and so we have um, policies that really prioritize that mobility investment to create those um, access connections. Thank you, Heidi. Here's a good one. How hard was it legally and legislatively to change how park funding was allocated? <laughs> so a little bit of background is that um, I worked in the city attorney's office um, for this same jurisdiction for over a decade um, before joining the planning department. Um, and during that time, um, I happened to one of my roles was to be the advising attorney um, for all development impact fees and financing issues. Um, and so I had a little bit of an advantage coming in um, to kind of shake up and reform the existing system. Um, we currently, as I mentioned, have over 50 different community planning areas um, just due to the historical trends of development in our city. Um, we have, you know, kind of an urban core, um, which is our um, older communities, and then we've had um, what have been referred to as planned urbanized communities, but it's really a fancy term for um, planned suburban communities. Those planned suburban communities over the past several decades have seen, you know, really, really, really great park investments, um, and that's been largely due um, to the collection of updated development impact fees in those areas. While the more developed urbanized communities haven't seen um, this commensurate um, updating um, the plan. So um, we know that that system is not working um, for our new development trends, as well as the communities of concern where we know that these investments are really needed. We want to take what's in the suburban communities and the really great new fancy flashy um, recreational resources, and we want to see those investments happening where the most people are living. Um, under our climate action plan and all of our planning policies, we're planning for all of our new growth to be occurring in areas located next to transit. This aligns with our climate goals um, and we need parks to support that development. But we don't just need regular parks, we need parks that meet the needs of this new, more dense, compact development, um, which is why it was also really important for us to have this new standard um, that wasn't based on providing acreage um, which with large swaths of land in, an, in a newly suburban um, tract housing model. Um, but in terms of the legal, <laughs> the legal um, issues with that, um, I think fortunately I've been able to get a little bit of credibility throughout my career with respect to um, the legal ability to charge fees. Um, and so it hasn't been as bumpy of a road as it probably could have been. Um, but we did move from a completely different way of um, doing our nexus study. We had 50 different nexus studies that were based on specific projects identified in the communities. Um, the reality is that we do not have the staff resources to update 50 different nexus studies on any kind of regular basis. And um, we know that we need we needed to have a better plan in order to be able to implement from that. Um, we currently have four, over $400 million sitting in 50 different pots of money that we're unable to expend because there's not enough money in each individual pot to complete a project. Um, and those types of statistics are really persuasive um, for the politicians um, when they want to see park um, investments happening now. Um, 
really the only way out of that is for us to be able to pivot, um, really be innovative, think outside the box, um, and come up with a new system that allows the city to actually deliver parks assets as we collect the funding. It's not without controversy. We're going to have a lot of discussion over the next couple of weeks before we hopefully get this approved. Um, there is some redistribution of um, funding um, between um, different areas of the city. Um, but luckily, I do think that we have support um, on our council um, for that because there is um, such a marked um, discrepancy um, in the, the quality and quantity of resources throughout the city. And I, I do think that there's an, an overall understanding of the need to prioritize investments where they're needed the most. But from a legal basis, I don't have any concerns about it. We've really taken pains to draft our parks master plan to tie in um, this theory and this um, this policy of an interconnected citywide system for everybody. The reality is that we're a mobile city. Um, I am not constrained to using the parks that are just within the community that I live in. Um, I am welcome to and I do use um, parks throughout the city and we want everybody to be able to have access um, to parks throughout the city. So totally switching gears, one uh, of many things we share is uh, an aging demographic. Uh, we're also uh, rapidly increasing the number of seniors over the age of uh, 60. What are some of the ways the master plan uh, uh, plans to meet the needs of your aging population? Yeah, so we not only have an aging population, but we also have um, a high youth population. Um, and so um, what we see is that there's often ways to um, to take that and meet the needs um, of not only the senior population, but of, of the youth population as well. Um, we do have an emphasis um, on senior programming um, within our Parks and Recreation Department. Um, that's something um, that we really rely on the operational part of it um, for our, our, our partner department, the Parks, Parks and Recreation Department to implement. Um, we do currently have um, in our city in the Parks and Recreation Department um, an emphasis um, on providing um, programming services to seniors um, and then also a corresponding access on providing programming services to youth as well. Um, that is um, proposed to be continued throughout this plan. Um, and then in addition to that, really focusing on how do we deliver recreation centers, senior centers, um, and the facilities that we haven't seen um, anything new constructed in many, many, you know, sometimes decades, um, really kind of comprehensively looking at our funding um, and how we can leverage it um, to provide the capital investments to support the programming that's already existing um, with what we have right now. Well, one more thing that we are doing, which is a future implementation um, part of the Parks Master Plan is that we're going to look at our aging population and map it so that we can see where those pockets are and how making sure that there are parks and recreation opportunities for them close to where they live as well. But that's a future implementation action for us. And that's a really good point. Um, and it brings us back to our access standard and our value and our and how we value parks is that you know, what we saw um, happening over the last several decades was um, decisions being made to locate parks um, in the place where it was easiest to locate them. So if there was a vacant area of land, um, that's where we would locate the park without any regard to its proximity and access to the users that would be using it. So, for example, um, we don't we don't necessarily um, have a need for a senior center that's not located um, near a community that has a large population of seniors. Um, what we need is we need to find we need to match the, the availability of land and space um, with the needs of the the users that would be using that area. So the next question's from me. Um, we're, uh, as I'm sure most park and rec agencies around the country, we're trying to be creative in ways that we uh, get more people into our parks. And sometimes when you're creative, you get pushed back because you're experimenting and you hope everything will go fine. But sometimes, sometimes even if everything does go fine, communities fear uh, that it won't and you, you get pushed back. I'll, a couple examples for us. Um, we have a program called Picnic in the Park where we're uh, trying to encourage people to order from restaurants to support restaurants during the pandemic and come have a picnic in the park and we're doing an experiment where we're allowing the uh, restaurants to del deliver alcohol. 
Uh, and that got quite a bit of controversy about this idea that people are going to be drinking in a park. And another example, we um, we uh, closed some uh, park roads on weekends to allow uh, access for pedestrians and bicyclists. And some communities are concerned because they don't have vehicle, vehicular access to the roads and cut through traffic and other things like that. So my question is in this master plan, uh, are there any areas where you thought you were creative that you ended up getting pushback in any way from either elected officials or communities? Uh, so yeah, um, there's always pushback um, that you get. Um, we balance a lot of different stakeholder um, input. Um, we have um, obviously um, the development industry, um, our environmental organizations, um, as well as our park advocates, um, and then our traditional um, community planning groups. Um, I will say through the process, I really do believe that as we've had the opportunity to have kind of more um, intimate, um, smaller, um, briefings and presentations. Um, we've been able to get feedback um, and buy-in um, on a lot of things that some people may have a year or two thought was very controversial. Um, as we've pushed forward with some things that um, some would consider to be significant changes, um, such as, you know, this change to a park standard a couple of years ago, um, you know, people kind of said, are you crazy or you, I, you, you don't really think that you're going to change this to you. <laughs> um, but, you know, here we are. Um, and um, the same thing with the, the park development impact fee. Um, it's a really comprehensive reform um, that we've put forward. I do think that being honest about the change has been um, really critical to us continuing to move forward with it. Um, we've kind of owned it in our presentations. You know, we haven't tried to say that it's not a big change. What we've tried to do is show data that shows why the change is needed. Um, and then the other thing that we've done is we've acknowledged um, that it is something new um, and is something that um, will really hinge on implementation success. Um, we've also acknowledged that we can't predict the future or um, changing needs. And so um, we've designed this plan to include a continual monitoring component um, so that as issues are identified, we have the ability administratively to address them. We also uh, got quite a bit of pushback on the including park related commercial activities within parks. Um, and the aim for that is to make sure that the park is always activated. And if, if we have a commercial use within that's related to the park within the park, it'll promote more promote more use and then have more eyes on the park, just having more people there. So we got some pushback on that as well. Yeah, and you know, another thing that we did that was kind of interesting is we did do an online forum that we had facilitated by a nonprofit that donated their services to us. Um, and we had, um, I think, over 300 participants in this online forum, and we um, put up a series of questions. And the, one of the things that we did that was really interesting with that is I th we had kind of had a question that asked about um, what people thought of smaller public spaces and if they were in favor of, um, you know, smaller, more urban parks. And kind of the answers at the first were, no, not really. We would really like, you know, a larger traditional park. And then we threw up a picture of um, that piazza that um, Jonathan had showed you during the presentation, which is one of our really great um, plazas that we've had added to our recreation system over the past couple of years. We put a picture of that up and said, you know, do you like this? And it was like overwhelming. The response was, oh, yeah, we love that. That's really cool. You know, everybody really likes to go to that plaza. Um, so that's kind of an example of people's gut reaction is I don't really like anything that changes, but if you can show them real life examples of something that they really enjoy, um, it really kind of helps um, um, kind of allay the concerns um, of that commercialization. That, that plaza is anchored by um, restaurant establishments that surround it, um, but it's still a really thriving and active um, and successful public space. One facility that is in really high demand here that we can't supply enough of is dog parks. Did you hear a lot about dog parks over the last three years? <laughs> well, it's interesting that that's happening in every jurisdiction. Um, we do have a very, we actually have, um, it's a stakeholder group that was formed um, just consisting of dog owners um, and they're very active. Um, they're a very active constituency. 
Um, so not just on this initiative, um, but we've um, had a lot of other um, um, more focused parks master plans that, um, you know, region specific master plans that we've brought forward over just the last couple of years, just within the last one or two years. Um, and we do um, hear um, a lot from, from the dog ownership constituency. Um, we really do still try to balance um, the needs um, for the dog parks with um, the, the need for providing that diverse um, ray, array of recreational resources. Um, we think that there's a place for dog parks, um, but um, when we hear kind of the feedback that, you know, the entirety of a specific park should be dedicated to off-leash dog areas, and we, we do really try and balance that, but it is a very controversial topic. And we acknowledge um, dog parks through our park scoring matrix, so when you score a park and you come up with its recreational value, there are there is a category in there for a dog park, for a small dog park and large dog park. And then also um, during the what we call the general development plan, which is a community process for designing a park, um, that's kind of when or that is when the residents would ex express their desire for a dog park um, in that process. Okay, here's um, here's a, a question that just came in. Urban areas have a higher land price tag. What new facilities are you envisioning for urban areas that will serve a more diverse community? Does the community survey show a desire for multi-use facilities? Yeah, so we know in urban areas um, that we do have a need for more parkland. Um, one of the ways that we do hope to achieve that, um, as I mentioned, um, all of our new development um, mostly is being planned um, along transit corridors. Um, and so there's a higher land value and there's less of that land. Um, we've, through our development impact fee that we've provo proposed, um, provided a series of incentives to provide on-site parks um, and dedicate that land um, with a with an in perpetuity public recreation easement. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we are encouraging the acquisition of new land for parks. Um, that being said, we also know that, you know, it's very challenging to get new parkland. And so what we want to do is look at a lot of the existing public spaces that we have and see how we can increase the value of those spaces. And we do have a lot of urban parks that have a lot of unused areas of that parkland. Um, and so um, we are hoping um, that with community input, we can meet individually um, with the affected communities um, and do further surveys um, to get um, feedback on what can can be done um, and reimagined with those existing spaces to provide more um, recreational opportunity to the community. And um, if I can add something, we also created a, an alternative compliance um, section to our scoring program, our scoring matrix. So that way in the future, when park designers or landscape architects come up with a new innovative way to use this very tight urban space that we're able to accommodate them and, and assign value to those as well. One of the things that's been really helpful when we've presented to the community and to different stakeholders is we've just actually taken examples um, of a park um, space that um, was reinvested in. Um, so for example, we have a community in um, our City Heights neighborhood, um, which is um, a very diverse community. Um, and um, we showed the before and after pictures. Um, we had gotten a grant a number, number of years ago and we added a new skate park, uh, skate park um, as well as a new playground and um, open turf areas, really improved that park. Um, and so those types of examples are really um, persuasive. Um, when we explain what we mean um, by upgrading and reinvesting in our existing park spaces. Um, we've also taken um, existing park spaces that haven't been upgraded yet, um, and Jonathan and his team have kind of provided some just example markups of what could be done with those spaces under this new program. So clearly this is about a park master plan, but to serve a lot of the goals of the plan, you must have had to have interaction and collaboration with other uh, uh, branches of uh, city government or state government like transportation or utilities. Can you talk a little bit about any partners that you really were um, 
important uh, stakeholders during this three year journey? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we're a really large organization. We have over 11,000 employees. Um, we do partner. Um, so we in the planning department um, really are, are the, the planning arm of the city. So we provide the plans for a variety of implementing departments. And so we refer to them as our implementing partners. So for this particular um, plan, um, Public Works Department, um, which actually you know constructs the park facilities as well as our park, park and Recreation Department, which operates and maintains the facilities were our main departments. We also have a sustainability department that we partner with um, and do their planning for them as well, um, but they provide a lot of um, um, assistance to us um, in working to ensure consistency with the Climate Action Plan. Um, and then also um, they do a lot. The Sustainability Department is the department within the city that does a lot of outreach with the communities of concern um, and so we have um, a lot of overlap between our departments on that. Um, we also coordinate with our regional planning agency which in our region is called the San Diego um, um, <laughs> I don't even know what the acronym stands for, but it's it's SANDEG. It's our regional Sandeg, planning yeah. agency. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so we um, coordinate with them for the overall transportation policy, especially with the connections outside of our city. Um, we are one of many jurisdictions within our city, and we do connect um, to a lot of other um, agencies that um, have recreational opportunities to offer as well. So one example is um, the San Diego Unified Port District. Um, owns a lot of recreational areas um, that we um, can provide connections to, so we've had coordination with them as well. So I think that is it for q and A. I I uh, just want to thank Heidi and Jonathan so much for sharing their uh, experiences and insights with us today. Again, um, there's so much commonality between our jurisdictions. It's really surprising me we're on opposite sides of the, the country, but 95% uh, of the stuff we're focused on is very, very similar. So I uh, we have a lot to learn from each other and I want to keep this dialogue going, but today I just need to thank you and I need to wish you success and hope to hear in a few weeks that you've got an adopted uh, master plan and uh, we'll send you a, a virtual thumbs up as soon as we get the good news. But uh, thank you so much for joining us today and it was a great presentation. So for the audience, so uh, as you know, as soon as we have a next uh, topic, we will post it on our website, montgomeryparks.org backslash speaker series. Uh, we also, of course, advertise them through social media and other means. So stay tuned and uh, we, as soon as we have our next topic, uh, we will reach out to you. But uh, once again, thank you so much to the city of San Diego and to Jonathan and Heidi. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.